And uh, we've got a guest with us that I'm excited to have here. But what he's talking about today is so much a part of how you and I carry the message of Jesus into our culture and into our community. And I think that's the challenge is we all understand that there's this call for us to do this. There's opportunities in front of us. But as we studied in our Forgotten God series, there's this tension sometimes between our weakness and God's empowerment. And, uh, and so um, we've got a, a friend here today to, to share. And I'm excited about it because a couple of years ago, I first heard about who he was. Uh, in fact, if some of you remember me talking about the idea of being a guest as we, as we live missionally towards other, the idea of guesting, um, that's actually an idea that uh, came from this guy that I first heard it from. And uh, last summer was up at Schweitzer picking huckleberries with another friend, and we were just talking about this whole concept and this whole idea. And, and, uh, and so um, this guy is, is a guy that just challenges when I listen to him speak. He writes books on things that nobody I've ever known writes books on. And, uh, and really is interesting and fascinating and smarter than I am in a lot of regards. But uh, Dr. Amos Young is um, uh, currently the director of the Center for Missiological Studies at Fuller Seminary down in California. Just recently went there. And, uh, and previous, previous to that was the dean of theology at uh, Regent Divinity School. Um, so was doing that before that. I have friends that say he's the, one of the most influential theologians on the planet today. Uh, I have one friend who says he's the most important Pentecostal theologian on the planet today, to which he says Pentecostal theologian is an oxymoron. <laughs> <clears throat> and it is, you know, I had a friend years ago, he's like, name one good Pentecostal theologian, and finally I've got one, and his name is Amos Young. <laughs> so I emailed him recently and said, listen, <laughs> there's one good one, but... Uh, but would you give him a warm welcome as he comes? We're just privileged to have such a great communicator and teacher and respected individual. Thank you, brother. Yes, sir. Good morning. It's good to be here. Thank you, Pastor Brad, for the welcome. My wife, Alma, is right here in the front row. <laughs> And I was asking my wife this morning, or last night when we came into Spokane, I said, when was the last time you and I stayed in Spokane? And she said, probably almost 25 years ago when, and by the way, she's an Eastern Washington native. Uh, Moses Lake! <laughs> and when we first got married, uh, our second year, we moved up to Moses Lake, and I was looking for a job, and I found a job working for the state of Washington at the time. This was in 19... 88, 89, and one of the things they did was they sent us for a number of training sessions right here to Spokane, Washington. And I think there were one or two weeks in which you came with me at the time, and she said, yeah, that was a long time ago, back in the late 80s. How many have been around since the late 80s? <laughs> Aren't you guys going to move at some point? Oh, just, I'm sorry. <laughs> but it's great to be back. It's been a while since we've been in Spokane, but uh, we've been looking forward to this trip back up here. Um, and uh, great to worship with you. Thank you, Pastor Brad, for the invitation and privilege this morning to open the Word of God and share it with you. If you did bring something like a Bible, you can turn with Luke chapter 1. If you didn't bring your Bible and are more used to you know, typing that into your cell phone or whatever the case might be, please feel free to do that. And while we're getting there to Luke chapter 1, can I also give you some additional perspective on how I got here this morning? Is that okay? Just take a couple minutes to do that. There's a big conference uh, next couple days right here in Spokane that Pastor knew about, and uh, Pastor was um, thinking about, you know, he always wants to bless you guys with the best speakers, amen? So he's thinking to himself, he's looking at the line of the, of the speakers coming to this conference, he's saying to himself, well, why don't I see if I can get one of those fellows or, you know, gals to come up uh, a couple days early and come preach at Summit Church? He said, well, I think I'm going to get the most dynamic and eloquent preacher I know. He's looking over this list over here, ah, I know who this person is, text the person, say, can you come a couple days early? Be with us here at Summit Church. Person looks on his calendar and says, sorry about that, I've committed to another church in town. Bummer. <laughs> Not to be deterred, he's looking back over that list. He goes, I can't get the most dynamic and eloquent speaker I know, but I can get the most brilliant person I know, right? So he's looking over his list, identifies that person, now picks up the phone and calls that person. Person looks at his calendar and says, well, actually, I'm flying into Boise that weekend. I've got something else going there, and da-da-da, da-da-da. Gosh, I can't do that. He's now getting a little bit desperate. Couldn't get the most you know, eloquent, dynamic speaker he knew. Can't get the most brilliant person he knew. He says, I'm just going to settle for the best-looking guy I know. <laughs> so, 
course, he calls me. <laughs> what are you laughing? I, you know, you know, you're coming. Can you, can you come a couple days early? Come be, uh, speak at some church. I'm looking at my calendar. It's kind of tied up. But I say, Pastor Brad, I'll agree to come. So I'm here. But I tell you, the real reason why I showed up is because I just couldn't bear to say no to him three times in one day. Now, if you believe that, I've got something else to sell you. (laughs) Actually, I do. It comes from Luke chapter 1. I'm going to read a few verses, 3 in chapter 1, and then a few verses in chapter 3 of the Gospel of Luke. If you don't know where that is, turn to Mark and go right, or go to John and go left, okay? Luke chapter 1, starting verse 15. And by the way, I'm titling the few minutes we have this morning. Let me see, what was that title? The Voice in the Wilderness Heralding the Spirit-Empowered Life. And I want us to look at the voice in the wilderness early in the Gospel of Luke. You can't imagine who we're going to be looking at, right? For those of you that know a little bit about the Gospel of Luke, that know about voices in the wilderness. Luke chapter 1 Verse 15 reads like this. Now, this is the angel speaking to Zechariah. Zechariah was a faithful priest. And in the middle of that promise to Zechariah, the angel says, For he, the son that he's talking about, he will be great in the sight of the Lord. How many of you would like to have that kind of prophecy about your kid? Or about yourself? Amen? He will be great in the sight of the Lord. He is never to take wine or other fermented drink. Now all of a sudden all the volunteers put your hands down, right? (laughs) And he will be filled with the Holy Spirit. So we'll just bypass that little clause in the middle. He will be great in the sight of the Lord and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit. Now move forward now to verse 41. When Elizabeth, now who's Elizabeth? She's the wife of this guy, Zechariah, to whom the angel showed up and made this promise. And now she's pregnant. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, who's Mary? Elizabeth's niece. Mary's pregnant too. She's going to have a child in a few months, and his name is going to be Jesus. When Elizabeth, old, creaky, ancient aunt, (laughs) heard Mary, young, vivacious, worried teenager. Right? When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leaped in her womb. Whose womb? Creaky's womb. baby leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the, you can help me, Holy Spirit. Now, you know that this guy, Luke, do you know that he wrote another book in the Bible? How many know that? Who's that? And what what was the other book? Acts. The book of Acts is all about the early followers of Jesus being filled with the Holy Spirit. So when you read, next time you read the book of Acts, you're trying to figure out what all's going on. That's the second book, right? Whenever you, you, whenever you dive into the middle of a story, you're trying to figure out what's going on, best thing to do is do what? Consult the beginning of the story, right? And the beginning of the story starts right here. And the first two people that get filled with the Holy Spirit, one of them is actually told about it, Zechariah that his son will be filled with the Holy Spirit. The second one is this son's mother. She gets a dose of the Holy Ghost right there when her young, vivacious niece walks through the door. Right? You got that? I'm going to fast forward just a second to the end of chapter 1, verse 80. 
And the child, what child? The one that got filled with the Holy Ghost in his mother's womb. His name is John. We know him by, as John the Baptist. And the child grew and became strong in spirit, and he lived in the desert until he appeared publicly to Israel. Now, one chapter over. Chapter 3. In the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, when Pontius Pilate was governor of Judea, Herod Tetrarch of Galilee, his brother Philip Tetrarch of Eturia, and Draconi Draconi Draconitus. You read this fast enough and you'll start speaking in tongues. Don't worry, it's just, <laughs> you know. Tetrarchs, one don't one roll of those. Just like governors, okay? Like Inslee? Tetrarch? All right. Some of you might have got that one. If you don't, don't worry about it. Verse 2. During the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas, the word of God came to John. Remember this guy that promised to his dad? Filled with the Holy Ghost in his mother's womb? Grew up in the desert? The word of God came to John, son of Zechariah, in the desert. He went into all the country around the Jordan, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. As is written in the book of the words of Isaiah the prophet, a voice of one calling in the desert. Prepare the way for the Lord. Make straight paths for him. Every valley shall be filled in. Every mountain and hill made low. The crooked roads shall become straight. The rough ways smooth, and all humankind will see God's salvation. Bow with me in prayer. Heavenly Father, who sent your Son Jesus, and then who poured out of your Spirit, you've already met us this morning in our worship. Continue, O God, to make the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts acceptable in your sight. And all God's people said, Amen. Voice in the wilderness, heralding the spirit-filled life. I've got three points to make. I teach, so I've got points. But uh, instead of putting it up in a PowerPoint and reflecting upon the fact that we're going to be talking about voices today, I'm just going to speak them, and then I want you to repeat them after me because we're going to have my voice and your voice kind of do a little dance, all right? So I'm going to say something, then you, then you repeat after me. Let's have our old practice on that. Okay, turn to your neighbor, look somebody square in the eye. Look, find somebody, look them square in the eye. Don't let anybody not look anybody in the eye. Find somebody's eyeballs and say, I am glad. <laughs> Louder. I am glad that I do not <laughs> look like you. There was a point to that. Luke, the author of Luke, and the author of Acts, tells us that the Spirit of God is poured out upon flesh. Pinch your neighbor. Come on, I got given permission to. That feels pretty fleshly, doesn't it? The Spirit of God is poured out upon flesh. That means people. That means you. That means me. And if we all looked alike, right, then the Spirit's witness through us is all going to sound alike. It's all going to feel alike. It's all going to be alike. It's not the point. Amen? The point is that God wants to fill men and women, young and old, slave and free, tells us that in Acts 2, I mean, I might remember that, right? And they were filled all in their own languages. That's also Acts 2, right? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, Cretans, Arabs, Persians. Translated in today's language, it means something like Spokanites. Well, what do you guys call yourselves around here anyway? Spokanites? Spokanites? <laughs> Moses Lakeites? <laughs> Ephrataites? Afraid? I'm an Afraidite. <laughs> Tricidiites. <laughs> Walla la 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 lights. <laughs> I 
If we all came from the same place and all looked like one another and all sound like one another, why would we need each other to bear witness? The Spirit of God is poured out upon flesh. It's you and I. So three points. Number one, the Spirit-empowered life blooms in the desert. I want you to repeat that after me. The Spirit-empowered life blooms in the desert. The Spirit-empowered life blooms in the desert. And we see this right here with John the Baptist, don't we? Someone who had lived, in, in fact, we, 180, chapter 1, verse 80, tells us that he spent all of his growing up years in the desert until his public appearance. That's a long time. How do we know that? Well, we know that his public appearance coincided with the public appearance of his cousin. Remember that? Aunt, niece, pregnant at the same time, creaky, vivacious, kids growing up together. The cousin, his name was Jesus. How long did it take him to show up? Yeah, a long time. 30 years, you know, other scholars say 29, third scholar says 28, eh. 27, 20, 25 years, a long time. Hello. He grew up 25, 26, 27, 30 years in the desert until he made his public appearance. And you're not asking ourselves, does any good come out of a desert? Come on, somebody. You spokenites. Oh, let me rephrase it in your jargon. Can any good come out of a valley? Can any good come out of somebody who wears camel's hair? I mean, is that so far-fetched? Look at, somebody take, you guys in the front row can't do it, but you guys sit in the back, I give you permission to look, pull the shirt of the person, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but you can, you can pull that thing, right? And then you can see something like uh, cotton or whatever. I don't even know what they, what they make these things with anymore, right? I mean, if it said camel's hair, then it probably costs you a lot. <laughs> Can any good come out of somebody who eats locusts? I don't want to ask how many out here have eaten locusts. <laughs> we'll probably all say, ugh. Okay? But your ugh is my yummy. My ugh is your yummy. I mean, I grew up eating Chinese food. Surprise, surprise. <laughs> My wife, who grew up in Moses Lake, didn't even know what Chinese food was until she went to college in California. <laughs> I didn't ask her permission for this, but she tells it anybody, anyway. And she went to a Chinese restaurant for the first time with our Chinese friend. I wasn't there at the time. This was before she met me. And she goes, Solomon, what's that floating around in my tea? Right? What was it? Eww. It was just tea leaves. Can any good come out of a locust eating, camel hair wearing desertite? The spirit empowered life blooms in the desert. And I don't want us to think only about literal deserts. Amen? The desert may well characterize all of our lives. Some of us might say, you know, I, Brother Young, I, I don't have an education. Neither, it looks like, did John the Baptist. I mean, he went to desert school. <laughs> His teachers were the locusts who he was trying to grab. His teachers were the camels who he was trying to shear. <laughs> His mother tried to teach him, I'm sure. His mother, we know, was a woman who lived into her old age without any children. Some of you might know the story of Elizabeth. When she found out that she was pregnant and blessed of the Lord, she thanked God and said, Lord, now my disgrace has been taken away from me. His mother lived in the desert, not literally. 
But she lived in this place of isolation. She lived in this place of stigmatization. She lived in this place of alienation. Why? Because women her age and much younger were expected to have children. And for years and decades, she said, why Lord? Where Lord? She was faithful. She kept showing up with Zechariah in the, in the temple to perform their priestly duties. She did what she was supposed to do, but what she was supposed to do was bear a child. And she had to live with that failure. Women had to live with the failure in those days. They didn't quite have mechanisms to figure out whether or not it might have been Zechariah's fault. Somebody say amen. <laughs> but she lived with the stigma. She lived in the desert. And then John the Baptist finally comes, and she's excited, and she's praising God, and he's filled with the Holy Spirit while she's still carrying him. Now, you ladies that have had children before, you can probably understand it a whole lot better than me. No way men's in that one? Right? The sense of God's, God's answering my prayer. God is filling me with the Holy Spirit and this child that is going to come forth and all these prophecy, prophecies that were given. He's going to go forth and do great things. He's going to vindicate our name and the name of our family. All those hopes, all those aspirations. And what does he decide he wants to do? He wants to grow up in the desert. He didn't want to go to Harvard. He didn't want to go to Yale. He didn't even want to go to Eastern Washington, even though I was in the desert, I think. No, he, he just wanted to go hang out with the locusts and camels. And she'd already lived 30, 40, 50, 60 years, wondering, waiting. And now he's in the desert, growing. And she keeps waiting. And she keeps believing. The desert doesn't have to be a literal space, a literal place. The desert is that, that, that dry, that difficult, that lonely, that challenging place that, that every one of us have known. And perhaps many of us, even here and now, say, you know what, yeah, Spokane might be a luscious valley, but it might be a desert for me. It might be a desert for us. It might be a desert for anyone. But the Spirit-empowered life blossoms in the desert, amen? The Spirit-empowered life blossoms in the desert no matter how dry, no matter how barren it might seem. No matter how bereft of all of the things that you and I would expect, all of the signs, but you might say, you know what, Brother Young, I, you know, my, my father wasn't given prophecies about me. My mother wasn't filled with the Holy Spirit when I was in her womb. She might have been filled with some other spirits, but we won't talk about those. I didn't have all the, the benefits that John the Baptist had. But when we read about John's life, and when you fill in the blanks, who grew up in the desert, we would have said, where, would, where is the Spirit in that? Where is the Spirit-empowered life in that? And we see the Spirit-empowered life here because it says that during the time the Word of God came to John, son of Zechariah, in the desert. Not after he got taken out of the desert, not after he left the desert behind. If you and I are waiting and we're saying, God, get us out of this desert so I can use you, well, then we're just kind of not giving God the opportunity, are we? To allow His Spirit to meet us right here, right now, in these circumstances, in this location, in this space, in this time. The time in which his mother was longing and yearning and praying for and hoping for, it was his time. The Spirit of God, the Spirit-empowered life blossoms in the desert, point number one. Point number two, the Spirit-empowered life unfolds in God's plan and place. The Spirit, repeat that after me, the Spirit-empowered life unfolds in God's plan, unfolds in God's place 
unfolds in God's world. You might say, you know, the desert is a lonely place to be. The desert is a dangerous place to be. The desert is an awful place to be. But God made the world, which includes deserts. Amen? And in the 15th year of this particular desert sojourn of John the Baptist, in the 15th year of what? Of the reign of Tiberius Caesar. Luke wants us to understand that this is not just some make-believe desert. This is not just some abstract desert. This is not just some spiritualized desert. This is a real desert in real time, in real space, in real history. And he's giving us the coordinates. The desert of Judea. When? In the 15th year of Tiberius Caesar. And you and I are sitting here, 15th year of Tiberius Caesar. What's that all about? What if I said something like instead in the sixth year of the presidency of Barack Obama? Now, regardless of how you feel about Barack Obama, when we say the sixth year or the seventh year of the president of Barack Obama, we've located the coordinates, haven't we, of the complexities of our lives, of the challenges of our lives, of the difficulties that confront living in this world. Not the third year of Dwight Eisenhower, not the second year of Abraham Lincoln, there were challenges there too. But the sixth year of Barack Obama has its challenges, its victories, its aspirations, its hopes, its frustrations, its worries, its anxieties. We might be worried financially. We might be worried about the economy. We might be worried about our safety nationally. We might be worried about this issue or that issue. And Luke tells us that there was a time and there was a space. It was a desert time. It was a desert space in this particular slot in history. It was the 15th year of Tiberius Caesar. It was the years in which we had these particular governors, these particular tetrarchs in place the pilots, the Herods. John may or may not have known about all these folks. He certainly knew about one of them. He knew about Herod, didn't he? If you follow the gospel story along, you know that John knew about Herod. In fact, John probably knew, probably knew more about Herod than he wanted to know about Herod. If you know the story, you know what I'm talking about. He knew that Herod was sort of living in him. Well, not sort of. Herod was living an immoral life. And John called him out. And Herod didn't like it. And we know that Herod had him executed. John's witness that blossomed in the desert unfolded in God's world. And we might say, you know what? I don't know if I want that kind of witness. I don't know if I want that kind of testimony. You know, the same author of, God, of Luke, of the Gospel of Luke, Luke, St. Luke, who wrote Acts, tells us in Acts 1.8 that you shall receive power after the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And we're all saying, come on, Lord, give me the power. <laughs> Amen? So you shall be my witnesses. We love that, don't we? Lord, we shall receive power so we can be his witnesses. Unfortunately, the English translation for witnesses doesn't quite catch all the nuances in the word witnesses. Because the word witnesses in the original Greek is the word for martyrs. Oops. Take away the power, Lord. Take away the power. I don't want any of that power anymore. I, I don't want to be that kind of witness. <laughs> He was empowered. I mean, a lot of times we think that, that bearing witness, we, we, have, we have very conventional views of power. We think power means signs and wonders. We think power means healings and miracles. And maybe sometimes that's the case. But just because there are eight signs or wonders or just because there are eight miracles, none of those characterize John's witness. But he bore witness. He bore witness in his spirit-empowered life 
that unfolded in God's world. A world of Caesars. A world of Herods. A world of Pilots. And you and I might not often think that what we have to do or what we have to say or how our lives may in any way make a difference in this world. And I don't have a blueprint for you. I'm not going to say do these three or four steps and you're going to influence Barack Obama. But how do you know whether or not your witness will have this kind of impact? How do you know how far the borders of your desert extend? You don't know because you don't need to know. That's what it means to live a Spirit-empowered life. A Spirit-empowered life is faithful in the desert. A Spirit-empowered life looks after those camel's hairs. A Spirit-empowered life goes after those locusts. A Spirit-empowered life, we might say, you know, there's not a whole lot to it. But all of a sudden, the witness unfolds in the 15th year of a Tiberius Caesar with no intention of John the Baptist of ever wanting to impact empire, the Roman Empire. With no intention of John the Baptist of ever wanting to cross paths with the principalities and powers. But now was the time, now was the place. And you and I might say to ourselves today, You know, I I don't have any global significance. In fact, I'm the opposite of significance. I am insignificant. I'm just a high school student. I'm just a a second year student at a community college. I just have a little desk job over here in this little building. Oh, I'm just just a housewife. I I just take our kids to the, the soccer on weekends. How do we know that desert doesn't have God's plan written all over it. How do we know faithfulness in these things doesn't have spirit empowerment undergirding it? How can we know unless we open up ourselves to see that the word of the Lord can nevertheless come through this desert, this space, That the spirit of power life can indeed unfold into God's big world. We might not have the vision, but we don't have to, because that vision's not ours. That's God's vision. The God who called another guy out of another desert three, four thousand years ago, his name was Abraham, and he promised him, he said, through you all the nations of the world will be blessed. And if you read the subtext of Luke and Acts, part of that story is God's desire to renew and to restore the nation of Israel. And it's happening through people stuck in deserts, eating locusts, going on their quiet little ways, seemingly insignificant. Feeling insignificant is no excuse for not living a spirit-empowered life. Do I get an amen out of that one? Oh, watch out now. (laughs) Something might happen. Something might happen. Witness might flow forth. So the spirit-empowered life blossoms in the wilderness. The spirit-empowered life unfolds in God's world, and I've only got a couple minutes for point three. The spirit-empowered voice bears God's fruit. Repeat that after me. The spirit-empowered voice bears God's fruit. The Spirit-empowered voice bears God's fruit. John recognized who he was. No bachelor's degree behind his name. No master's degree behind his name. No credentials. No name. That's exactly what he was. I am just a voice, just a voice, a voice nevertheless shaped by history, a voice shaped by living in the desert, a a voice shaped by the pursuit of locusts, 
a voice shaped by praying parents, a voice shaped by maybe visiting maybe visiting the, the, the temple every once in a while with his father, but, but by and large staying in the desert. A voice shaped by all of that specificity and all of that real life stuff. But nevertheless, a voice that was empowered to resound. Voices come for specific places and times. But once they are spoken, they echo. They transcend the limitations of their spatialness, of their temporality. They transcend the particularity of the context within which those voices have been shaped. And all of a sudden, his was a voice that was capable of speaking beyond his desert. His was a voice that was capable of speaking beyond his particular set of concerns. Why? Because his voice was also the voice of the Spirit. The Spirit who's poured out upon all flesh. The Spirit who is the breath of the living God. The Spirit who is the breath of God like a wind that comes from places that we don't know about, that goes in directions that we can't predict. The breath of Yahweh who before there was even a world, before there were planets and solar system and stars, when there was nothing but the deepness and the darkness and the voidness of things, the breath of God who hovered and trembled and resounded over that depth, that deepness and that darkness and that said, let there be light and there was light. Here was now John's desert-shaped voice that was caught up in the winds of God's voice in order to declare, make way for the coming of the Logos who spoke the worlds into existence through the breath of God and who now calls us into salvation with God. John understood himself as just that voice. A voice calling in the desert, make the way for the Lord straight. Every valley shall be filled and every mountain and hill made low. The crooked road shall become straight. This is our witness to participate in the witness of the Spirit of God. To declare to others that their roads have been strained out. Their valleys have been flattened out. Their mountains, meaning the impediments of their lives are being resolved by God. Why? Through the coming of the Lord, Jesus Christ. It's no mystery, it's no coincidence, I think, that John quotes here out of Isaiah 40. If you go back through the, the book of Isaiah, it's a long book, but you can take any of the first 39 chapters and you read it, and it's about desert. It's about exile. It's about alienation. It's about judgment. It's about loneliness. It's about struggle. And in chapter 40, finally, the voice of the Lord, the breath of God, came to Isaiah the prophet and said, it is now time for me to speak words of comfort. Comfort my people. Comfort my people. Why comfort? Why? Because the time has come for me to take my people out of desert, out of exile, the time has come for me to announce that the Lord is here to make straight paths, to level every valley, to fill in every mountain, to lower every hill. The time has come for all of this struggle to be redeemed. And you and I, you and I might say to ourselves, you know, I still feel like I'm in, a, I'm in a desert. I still feel like I'm inadequate. I still feel like I'm weak, unempowered. The Spirit-empowered life bears God's fruit, not just for us, amen, but for the other. The Spirit-empowered life blossom in this desert-croaking inhabitant so that soldiers and tax collectors would come. Think about soldiers and tax collectors as the internal and external enforcers of empire. 
Tax collectors can't collect money. I'm not going to ask you who works for the IRS in this room. <laughs> Collection of taxes is about the principalities and powers of this world, its organization, its internal mechanisms. And we struggle as a, as a society. We debate about where our taxes should go to, how to, in, how to put our monies. Those are the internal mechanisms of empire. Soldiers are those that are the external enforcers of empire. And here we have a creaky, croaky voice, a locust-eating prophet in the desert. He doesn't have a degree in taxation. He hasn't gone to school with soldiers at West Point. He's only a voice living out God's voice. And God brings to this desert-dwelling creature the forces of the imperial armies, the forces of the imperial structures, and they say, what shall we do? You know, your neighbors, the people that you meet in the soccer fields with you, when your kids go and play for, the person in the cubicle next to you, your roommate or your, your study partner, we're all in this together, aren't we? We're trying to find our way. The tax collectors and soldiers came to John. They, they were looking to find their way. They, they were constrained in their circumstances. Maybe, maybe they had jobs that, that paid them well, but they knew better. They knew that they were part of a mechanism, a, a juggernaut of, of, Roman, of imperial Rome. And they said, I'm, I'm stuck in my circumstances. I'm, I'm, maybe I'm paying the bills, but, I, but there's more to life than this, isn't there? Yeah, they may have had their, their cush cush office job. But they were saying, I'm in the desert. What can we do to be saved? And this voice, this uneducated, unprepared, unadorned voice, makes straight their ways, invites them to a fuller life, invites them to prepare their hearts for the coming of the Lord, invites them to live into the salvation in Jesus Christ, that is God's heart, God's promise. And all of a sudden, you know, the fact that all he ate was locusts didn't matter. Because all of a sudden, here he was confronted by all these folks. And he's just trying to be faithful, trying to bear witness, but not by his own strength. The Spirit of God blossoms. The Spirit of power life blossoms in the desert. The Spirit of power life unfolds in God's world. God's huge world. Don't underestimate the, the potential of your witness. Because again, it's not your witness, is it? It's us living into the witness of God in Jesus Christ by the power of His Spirit. I'm going to close with this. I think many of us ask ourselves, how in the world can God use me? And this voice, John's voice, shows us that there are possibilities for which you and I have very little capacity to comprehend. His mom and dad probably envisioned a whole different kind of way of his impact of the world. Oh, they knew he was going to be a mighty man of God. I mean, that was, the prophecy was given by the angel. Right? They knew he was going to be a mighty man of God, but, but they could never have foreseen that that mighty man of God would spend 25 or 30 years in a desert, preach in the desert, and then the only time he went to the city was when his head got delivered. They would never have anticipated that that's the legacy of our son's voice. But here we are, 2,000 years later, and we're observing the spirit-empowered voice of John the Baptist still speak, still challenge us, still inspire us, still cause us consternation and worry, still intimidate us, and yet at the same time still give us hope. And we're wondering, you and I, Lord, what's my legacy? I don't have anything to offer, Lord. What's my witness? What's my voice? I feel like this guy, born in the desert, raised there, still living there, Wrestling with mundane things like locusts. How does all this make sense, oh God, in my life? 
faithfulness, open up your heart. Let Him be. Let Him move. Let Him impact. You know, Pastor Brad was saying earlier about some of the books I've written. I've written a good number of books. Kids growing up, I've got three kids under five years old. And then they would wake up in the morning, and I'd be sitting there at my computer, I'd be typing, they'd go to school, they'd come home from school, and dad's still sitting at the computer typing, and they think, dad never goes to work. <laughs> He's sitting in front of the computer all day long. <laughs> he didn't really do anything. And I'm writing, I'm trying, I'm trying to articulate these things, and, you know, pastor talks about the fact that uh, someone said something about me being the something best, best Pentecostal theologian or whatever. You're right, not only is that an oxymoron, since there's only two of us in the world, being the best isn't really a big deal, Okay. I mean, being the best of two, you know, it's kind of like, uh... but I'm sitting here trying to write these books. I'm trying to articulate things, and it's not really coming out all that good. And, you know, all the books that I write, like three people read them, and like two understand them, and I'm not one of them. <laughs> I'm just trying. I, I, I feel like there's something to say here, but it's, it's haltering. It's, it's faltering. It's, it's, it's like tongues, you know? Does anybody get it? Or am I just a voice that's just speaking to myself? In the last few years, our son, you know, the one that didn't think that dad went to work, just sat around all day, he's gone off to school and he goes off to college and he gets connected somehow to a local church, a mega church, and he gets invited to become part of their team. And he's now one of the lead pastors there at the church and he keeps coming back and calling mama, his mom and I, my wife and I, Say, Mom and Dad, thank you for how you invested in my life. It's not because we're great parents. Far from it. We've made more than your fair share of mistakes with our kids. (laughs) But don't underestimate the power of the Spirit to leave a legacy for your witness beyond the confines and the horizons that you can see. You and I can only see so far, just like John. And we might not even be able to see beyond this valley or this desert or whatever it is that that circumscribes your vision. That's what it means to be finite creatures. We're circumscribed. We we can't see it all. We can't understand it all. We we can't hope for it all. We can't even envision it all. We're just trying to get by, aren't we? We're doing our best, oh God, help us out. But I got good news for you today. The Spirit-empowered life blossoms in our deserts. The Spirit-empowered life unfolds in our world because it's God's world. And the Spirit-empowered voices will bear not our hopes and fruits, but God's hopes and fruits. Bow with me in prayer. Father, we thank you. You who called the world into existence through your breath. You who poured out that breath 2,000 years ago upon the followers of Jesus. You who even a little bit before that visited an old couple, Zechariah and Elizabeth, and who touched their lives, touched their bodies. You who then visited this voice in that desert. You who continue today to allow His witness to resound in our hearts. Oh God, take who we are in all the ways in which we're circumscribed and constrained. Take who we are with all of our frailties, our finitude. Take who we are in all of our fallenness and our fallibility. Take who we are in every circumstance of the deserts of our lives today, O oh God. And Lord, just like we lifted up our hands earlier this morning in surrender, right now again, we lift up our hands to you. Come, Holy Spirit, Spirit of the living God, renew our voice, renew your witness, renew your word in and through our lives. For your honor, for your glory, for your name's sake, that all persons may know the salvation of our God. In Jesus' name, amen.